afternoon, everyone, and um, uh, especially to those who just joined us now, to those who were with me and Steve Matteo before, thank you for hanging out. Um, this is the video podcast, Things We Said Today, live and in person. It happens once a year, and let's be thankful it doesn't happen more than that, uh, where we get together in person to chat. My name is Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio, New York City which is where we are at, uh, 90.7 FM, although as I've told uh, folks, we've got a funky antenna and a funky signal, okay, and dealing with the topography of New York City, there's no guarantee that even at the power we broadcast that our signal comes in loud and clear in this part of Queens or in Brooklyn. I know there's pockets of Staten Island and New Jersey where people have issues with our signal. Uh, so you go to WFUV.org and listen online or we get an app. You have We have an app and you can download that to listen. And I'm on the air from uh, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Monday through Thursday nights and Saturdays from 1 until 3, 1 until 4, excuse me. Obviously not today. Uh, and I'll be back on the 10 o'clock Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, it's all about anniversaries with the uh, 60th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in the U.S. And the fest itself, 50th anniversary. And on February 26th, it'll be my 40th anniversary on the radio at WFUV. But I am so thrilled to be on this show right now and be with these these guys who I call my friends. I really look forward to the show. Every other week in a perfect world, we do a show every other week. And we haven't produced one yet in 2004, which we'll get into. But please uh, allow me to introduce to you, you don't need the setup, ladies and gentlemen, Alan Cozen, uh, who Alan uh, and our, we have a special guest, Adrian Sinclair. Adrian and Alan, the authors of the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, and I guess at the end of the year, we're going to have Volume 2, and I've asked you this before, it's looking at four volumes? Three. Five? Um, we're looking at it four more if we can get them, Okay. but I don't think we'll get more, so it'll it's probably four. So Adrian and Alan, when this is all said, I mean right now, it's the essential, in my opinion, McCartney biography at the moment, if it's stopped right now, but we have volume two coming at the end of the year, and it's always an honor. I've read Alan for years in the New York Times, uh, and I turn to ask some of Alan's opinions when it comes to classical music, when I listen to it and go, and I don't get it. I look up stuff, and there's Alan explaining things to me, and he doesn't even know it. And it was over 40 years ago that I met this man over here uh, who was doing an overnight at W... What was the call letters at that time? W WZFM, Pleasantville, New York. And a <laughs> friend of mine who knew you said, let's go hang out with Ken Michaels. And it was the morning of December 24th. And we sat in and just hung out in the studio with you. And little did I know I'd be stuck with... I mean, I'd be uh, still here with you um, all these years later. Ken Michaels, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. If and I knew right there and then that I was going to do a podcast show with you, <laughs> even though there were no podcasts at the time. If you've heard it, and it's Beatles, Ken hosted it. It's that simple. And Adrian Sinclair, um, who I'm meeting now for the first time in person. Such an honor. You were on the show about a year ago, I guess, yeah, yeah. close to it, about, about the first book. Um, let's start with you, Adrian. Uh, just tell us a little bit about your background and how you and Alan linked up and this project came together. Sure. Uh, so my background is uh, actually in uh, filmmaking. So I've worked as a documentary filmmaker in England for 20 years now, um, working for most of the major broadcasters. Um, but like everybody who's here at this festival, um, you know, my passion is the Beatles, and I love McCartney's music. Um, and I work as a freelancer, so, uh, so that means basically I work between contracts, and I was looking for what you would call a side hustle, something to do to bring a few extra quid. Uh, and I decided I was going to write a book about Paul McCartney's studio sessions because it felt like something that hadn't been covered before. Uh, but what ended up happening, and we've told this story many times before, um, is that uh, d really it was down to Denny Sywell. He's the one to blame. We, we did a great interview with Denny Sywell, and right, right at the end of the interview, Denny said, um, oh, by the way, while I was in Wings, my wife used to keep these little diaries. 
um, is that something that would be of interest to you? And of course, you know, as a researcher, your ears prick up, mm -hmm. and you're trying to contain the excitement. Uh, and then me and Denny spent something like seven or eight hours on Skype, and he talked me through the inside story of Wings for three years. So I thought this is more than a studio sessions book. Uh, and at that point, really, um, I'd engaged Alan as a co-author because I felt that the project had kind of uh, outgrown something that one person could do. I'm sure that Mark Lewison could probably attest for that. Um, you know, we've been working on this project together, two books now, for 10 years. And, you know, collectively, that's 20 years worth of work between two people. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, Alan and I actually first met through um, various forums online that I'm sure a lot of you hang out on and shared bootlegs and things like that. Uh, and we've known each other for probably 20 years. Um, but it's, it's been a great uh, partnership, really. I can honestly say that during the time we've worked on this project together, we've never fallen out once. Is that right, Alan? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do it live. But no, I mean, uh, Alan's, uh, my background is really in um, research and storytelling as a, a documentary maker. Uh, it's all about getting to the truth uh, and then telling that story in, in the most interesting way. Um, and with our book, obviously, it's, it's quite easy because it's chronological. Um, but Alan's experience and background in, uh, in, as a music critic, it, it blows my mind to this day. Some of the stuff he's written for this second volume, it, it just, uh, when I read it, it, it just takes my breath away. It's just so, so good. And yeah, uh, his, his wife actually called it the first time we met. She just said, yeah, I think you guys are a good fit. Yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's just kind of worked out. Uh, so anyway, that's the very long-winded story of how this book came about. Could I just ask, you know, when you first started working on this, you must have known what a daunting task this must be, you know, approaching someone who his solo career is 54 years, and you want to do this in such detail. I mean, we live in denial, Ken. <laughs> we thought we knew, <laughs> but we had no idea. <laughs> you know, we, we, we thought we had, uh, we probably both spent more time than the average human listening to Paul's work and the other Beatles work and the Beatles as a group and all of that and thought that we had a great handle on it but um, the research that Adrian did is just so extraordinary and then you know then we both we I mean the lines blurred I mean in, in the first volume um, Adrian wrote several chapters and I did several interviews and you know plus I had my own archive of McCartney stuff which was hmm. um, pretty good it, for, for volume three on it will get better because it becomes we're getting into the period where I began to cover him for the times so I have a lot more information than for the very early years okay. so um, you know there is a lot of crossover in what we do but you know the the timelines that Adrian put together with his source material and the archive that he assembled uh, you know it, it it just was extraordinary. I mean, if, if we were just to publish the timelines, they would be longer than the books themselves. You know, the, the time, the books almost in a way condense the timelines. Yeah, I, th I think the timeline for the second book, it clocked in at something like half a million words. Yeah. Because, you know, we chronicled every review of every concert in 76. I mean, that in itself, I think that took me about a month. Maybe One of the reasons the why we haven't had a show yet yeah. things we said today this year and this was just way it worked out was because of the editing process which was you know late in the year and early this year and Alan was like I have to lose 40,000 words and I'm like I haven't I haven't even read 40,000 words in my life wow um, it's like that old Beethoven decomposing book you know? <laughs> um, so here we are, and we decided, I think it's obvious, we should talk about McCartney and Wings with the book. Then you're still digesting volume one and with volume two coming in later on in the year. And it always interested me, now with Band on the Run being reissued for the, what is it, the 19th or 20th time? Um, and the anniversary having just passed, uh, most of Band on the Run was recorded in Africa, in Lagos, Nigeria. And it was, the first of McCartney's albums to be recorded in a unique location. McCartney was mostly done at home and in a studio 
Ram was done in a proper studio, and Wildlife recorded again in a regular studio. Uh, and Red Rose Speedway, same thing, but Red Rose Speedway was a little bit of a patchwork uh, stuff recorded in this studio. But again, we're talking traditional studio. And McCartney had the idea for Band on the Run that he wanted to do something different, something exotic, something cool, out of the ordinary. And the choice was Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and that seemed to start something. And I don't know if that was became Paul's like, all right, where can we go next, or just happy accidents? Because after Band on the Run, Wings spent time in 74 in Nashville, which segued sort of into New Orleans, and parts of Ve Venus and Mars were done, oh, I just got that connection, were done in New Orleans, and um, Wings at the Speed of Sound was a studio, that was an Abbey Road mm -hmm. creation, but then London Town on yachts, docked in the Virgin Islands, and back to the egg, partially in a castle. And so I thought, this is what we should talk about, the desire on Paul's part to record in unique locations with wings during the 70s. So um, let's go back to, I guess, the decision. Let's go to Africa. And the mm. response that Paul got to that and how that all played out. Well, I mean... He, d he denied it originally that he was going out there to assimilate African music, but that's what he was doing. You know, they'd watched that documentary by Ginger Baker uh, that contained a lot of um, Afrobeat music done by people like Fela Rance and Kuti. And you can see from Paul's perspective, if you watch something like that, it's going to be truly inspiring. He'd never seen anything like that before in his life. Um, and they said that they were kind of torn between studios in somewhere like maybe Rio de Janeiro or China, um, but ultimately they decided to go to Africa, and it was Ginger Baker's documentary really that pushed them in that, in that direction. Um, from our perspective, it was fascinating then assembling the timeline for Lagos, because never, no one's ever really told that story properly chronologically, and there were two key events that happened. Um, during that time that we really wanted to get a date for. One of them was when he saw Fela Rance and Kuti in concert because that was um, the night, uh, the day after that, he came to the studio, did Fela, and accused Paul of stealing the black man's music. So I happened to find a, a trade ad for Fela in concert in a Nigerian newspaper. So bingo, we've got one date. Uh, and the next date we were determined to find was the date that Paul and Linda were... Um, attacked at knife point and we found that purely by accident in a timeline that was sent to Paul's publicist at the time uh, Tony Brainsby so again we had that date um, and you know they'd worked on several songs up until the date of seeing fellas concert and then obviously went to the concert in the hope of finding some local musicians that might add some horns or something and much like they did in New Orleans in 1975 but they got, you know, obviously a, a much different reaction than they got in New Orleans. It was really hostile. Uh, but yeah, from Paul's perspective, really, the whole Nigeria trip was motivated by, you know, trying to soak up a, a new, a new brand of music. Um, Ginger hmm. Baker briefly is part of Band on the Run, correct? So uh, he played on one. Well, he shook a can full of rocks, basically. He didn't, didn't play in the way we think of Ginger Baker playing. Well, I was always wondering, why didn't uh, McCartney invite Ginger in to have more of a role yeah. uh, on, on the album? Well, we could only speculate, really, on that. But we, we figured you've got Paul McCartney and Ginger Baker in a room together. Um, you know, two big personalities. In Ginger Baker's case, a, a massive personality and and character in music. Uh, and you, I just don't think it would have been a good fit for one. Um, but also, I think the idea, you know, when they did then work in Ginger's studio, uh, Paul, Paul decided rather than laying down a, a standard beat for um, Picasso's last words, he did an experimental drum track, which was you know, backward loops of cymbals and things like that. Uh, and we could only see that really as Paul being intimidated by the idea of playing the drums in front of Ginger Baker. I mean, who wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. every, every drummer we've spoken to who's been in Wings, you know, Jeff Britton, Steve Holly, all these guys, Danny Sywell, they all named Ginger Baker in the top five drummers of all time. Right. So I think from Paul's perspective that there was no chance he was going to bring Ginger Baker into the mix. Uh, and interesting, to, but put, Denny Lane played in Ginger's band, so you would think that there would have been maybe yeah. a little bit of a bond there, maybe right. not. 
Right. I think Ginger Baker also is a somewhat busier drummer than Paul um, likes on his tracks. Mm -hmm. um, he used Ginger Studio, um, partly because Ginger sort of bailed him out of the Fela Kuti thing. And, you know, in, in gratitude, he went and recorded. Because, because that, was, uh, that, was, that was a big dispute between Paul and Ginger at the time. Um, Paul had sent his, uh, his manager at the time, a guy named Vincent Romeo, um, who was uh, an American, uh, went down to Lagos to check out the place to see whether it would be a good place to record and he spent some time with Ginger and Ginger was somehow led to believe that Paul would record the album there but Paul couldn't necessarily record the album there I mean he could have if he wanted to pay for it but if he recorded in EMI Lego Studios, it was an internal EMI charge. So that's almost like not paying for it. It's not entirely like not paying for it, but it's almost, you know, much better than if than having to pay a, a bill to Ginger. Um, there were there were other reasons he went. I mean, um, he did want to. Uh, he was attracted by the idea of, of um, as Adrian put it, based on Fela Kuti's charge. You know. Uh, take the black man's music. I mean, he wanted to be influenced by it in the same way Paul Simon later was right, right. Um, mm. when he went to do Graceland. But in addition, he wanted a place where the they could do the sessions but also be on vacation, sort of. He envisioned going to the beach or, you know, just hanging out in a nice warm climate. It had to be warm. Um, and, you know, he thought it would be a, a kind of good time. And so one of the reasons that Vincent Romeo was fired very shortly after those sessions was that, you know, partly the dispute with Ginger Baker seems to have been Vincent Romeo's fault for leading Ginger to believe that Paul would record there. Right. But also um, Romeo came back and said, yeah, it'd be a great place to record. And it actually was a fairly dangerous place. <laughs> you know, um, Jeff, Jeff Emmerich, uh, when he got there and went, you know, driving around town because it, they were put up in a uh, sort of uh, what we would call a gated community uh, that was sort of, um, you know, restricted and uh, high security for foreigners. Um, but uh, Jeff really disliked the place and so he got a hotel in downtown Lagos and he talked about how uh, you know he'd be driving in downtown Lagos and see someone walking along the street and with you know bandages all over him and he'd say to the cab driver what 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 is that and the cab driver would say well he's got leprosy you know and in in our parts of the world uh, you know you don't run into people with leprosy that much well my neighborhood <laughs> used to when i was no anyway that's, <laughs> no, i was just going to add that down the, the um, other thing uh, uh, from uh, with with the ginger baker studio uh, the reason why they didn't use it was as alan said was to do with charge off the back of red rose speedway which took paul what only 11 12 months to record he, he got a real ear bashing by EMI for how much money he spent making that record mm -hmm. for the return that they got on the record. Uh, so Band on the Run, if you look at it, is one of Paul's leanest albums. It was made in a really short space of time uh, between Lagos Air Studios uh, and then a little bit of mixing, which they did at Kingsway and EMI. So it was a really lean production time. And I can imagine for the return that EMI and Capital got from Band on the Run, they were pretty happy with right. the amount that was spent on making it. Uh, I, I want to, Ken, I'm sorry, I just had to thought. If I don't like my, lose my thoughts. Hmm. Uh, since the band on the run, uh, under, un, undubbed? Underdubbed. What is it? Underdubbed version just came out for the 50th anniversary. Tony Visconti, once again, has been rather vocal about uh, the fact that, and this is the legendary Tony Visconti who produced David Bowie and... Bad figure in the earliest days, and so on and so forth. Moody Blues. Tony was yet yeah, exactly the Moody Blues. Tony was the guy and responsible for a lot of the, if not all of the orchestration and all of the, a lot of the overdubs, and didn't get credit initially. And now he has all of this stripped off, the new edition. So I've seen a few 
kind of disgruntled posts on Facebook from Tony Visconti about this new this new edition of Band on the Run. Uh, he, Tony played a big role, did he not, in the finished finished product? Yeah. Um, Tony was given the task of doing orchestrations for, what was it, six or seven songs? Uh, <clears throat> and he was given uh, something like three days to do it. So he did it on no sleep and then had to come in and conduct the sessions and did that. And was a little upset to find that there was no credit for that. And if you look at um, certainly all the all of Paul's albums through Volume Two, I mean, I haven't you know taken the full discography out and 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 looked at it um, closely for this particular reason, but there I don't think there is a single arranger who Paul has credited as an <laughs> arranger. You know, he'll mm. he'll say thanks and mention the guy's first name or maybe even his whole name but it will never say what it's for right for th some reason um, i think that some of that might be down to the way that paul does his arranging though because if you look at if you listen to the underdubbed album you can hear some of those uh solos hummed by paul at the end of the song you know if you listen to the end of jet you can hear paul singing what's going to be the sax solo at the end um, so I think that the way Paul sees arranging is fundamentally different from the way a lot of other people see arranging, including the other Beatles, really, on that list. Also, there's mm. a big degree to which he actually, well, kind of what you're saying, but I'm, I'm thinking of there's a, a scene in volume two where the arranger went to Paul's house on Cavendish Avenue, and Paul said, so this is what I want you to do, and he took out this, you know, huge sort of score, what would be a score if Paul wrote music, but what he did is he wrote the names of all the notes that he wanted played in the arrangement and said, so you take it away and make it better, which partly meant you take it away and transcribe it into actual musical notation, but this is the arrangement, hmm. you know, and he was open to some changes that the arranger might do, but, uh, you know, so in some cases, um, he may not be crediting the arrangers because he sees them merely as uh, copyists, you know, who, whose job is to just transcribe his thoughts. But in the case of uh, Tony Visconti's arrangements, uh, our impression was that Tony had a lot more input um, on a lot of it. You know, th he went to Paul's house and they discussed what Paul wanted, and Paul was playing bits on the piano mm. for him. And Tony would come up with ideas, and uh, it, was, it was kind of an interesting scene because Tony went with um, his wife at the time, who was uh, Mary Hopkin, who Paul knew quite well, having produced her first album for Apple. Um, and so uh, Linda was talking to Mary Hopkin on one end of the living room, and Tony and Paul were working on the arrangements on the other end of the living room, and Tony was saying, you know, I have... I have a really good idea for this part. We'll have the strings coming up. And R Linda calls over and says, you're not going to block out my synthesizer line. <laughs> so. It's interesting listening to the, the score on that album, though, because you think that Africa had, a, had no influence on Band on the Run, but really, there's a lot of horns on, on that album. And fundamentally, that's something that Paul took away from Lagos. And also, he, he took away from um, some of his earlier musical influences. Uh, one of the uh, mad things we did when we were making the first book was we looked at these Polaroids that Paul that Linda took during the sessions of Band on the Run and they had these albums pinned to the studio walls and we tried to find out what all of these albums were because they were clearly albums that Paul was really into at the time or influenced by and one of them was uh, uh, an album by the Glenn Miller Orchestra and you can hear little hints of Glenn Miller in there as well in, in the Band on the Run orchestration so um, it, yeah that, that record is uh, an interesting hybrid of you know all, all those different kind of flavors coming together I just wanted to say about Tony Visconti, I've read that um, he got to hear just parts of the songs of Ben on the Run, not necessarily the complete song, and he was told to orchestrate just a little section here at a time, which made his job far more difficult, not hearing the full song. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm not sure he was allowed to take a tape away, was he? No. Hmm. So, so it may have been that they sat down on the night. 
uh, and they blocked out every one of those parts almost note for note before Tony left the house. Um, but but Tony is because he's so bitter about what happened and his credit. It's it's hard to read you know too much into some of the things that Tony says. He says, "Oh, I was never given this. I was never given that." We can't say that for a fact that that, that was the case. But but yeah, we we heard that as well that he went to the house. And Paul was kind of, um, you know, a bit conservative with, with what he allowed him to take away. Mm. What other examples can you give of um, the Lagos, the African influence on the album? If you talk about horns, obviously you think about Jet. But how do you know that going into the song, he already had that in mind? Oh, we don't know that at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But are there well, I'm, what I'm saying is it's interesting when you do listen to that song uh, and you listen to the, the horns that Paul chose to add to the song. Um, they are very much influenced by the sounds he was hearing around him at the time, whether it was Glenn Miller or whether it was fellow Ransom Cootie, you know, playing live, which, you know, he said in many interviews was one of the most... Um, emotional musical experiences of his life you know he said he broke down in tears um, whether or not that was just some very strong weed that they were smoking that <laughs> night uh, combined with I don't know malaria medication or something I don't know but, um, but yeah, that, I mean he had to have taken something away from it as I said in every one of these um, locations they visit you know they then went to Nashville in 74 uh, and that's obviously a really clear inspiration um, when he wrote Sally G uh, you know, they were out in um, Prince's Alley uh, and he was inspired by the music around him and went away and wrote a country song. Um, and, and to, a, you know, with, with Venus and Mars, it was the same. But it, it's funny listening to uh, interviews with Paul when he arrived in New Orleans in 1975. He was very clear when they arrived that they weren't there uh, to, to steal the music from the area, you know, having been told off by fellow Ransom Cootie in 1973. He said, you know, we're, we're definitely not here to be influenced by the, the New Orleans music scene. You know, and then, you know, a few days later, they're in a studio with uh, the, the entire New Orleans music scene behind them recording a song together. Before we uh, move into Nashville and New Orleans, very quickly, Paul, when he was mugged, talked about how he had the cassette tapes s stolen, were taken from him that featured the early mixes, the early demos of the songs on Band on the Run, and for years we heard that that was, well, that's the end of that, they were lost. But we talked last year uh, about how it's now kind of appears that somewhere the masters of those early Band on the Run demos were done with Henry McCullough and and Denny Sywell exist somewhere, which we then figured out was probably in a drawer of unused envelopes in Paul's office somewhere. <laughs> yeah, they exist somewhere. Um, they uh, aren't listed in any materials that we've seen in Paul's archives, but that doesn't mean that they're not mm -hmm. in Paul's archives. I mean, it's, it's sometimes a little uh, slapdash, these listings. But, um, you know, it, if it, it just stands to reason. We know from Denny Sywell that they recorded four-track masters um, up in Scotland, um, and Denny claims that um, it's the, the, master, the, the, the demos are better than the finished album, <laughs> but, of course, he's playing on them, so it's not necessarily... Uh, so we know that those four-track masters existed, it's very unlikely that Paul would be walking around in Lagos with a four-track master in his bag to get right. stolen. It had to have been cassette copies. You had mentioned you were going to ask Adrian to see if he could break into McCartney's compound to see if he could locate those master tapes. Did he ever ask you, uh, Adrian? No, I'm <laughs> no, kidding. No, we've never had that conversation. Anyway. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 74 rolls around now, Band on the Run's out, on the charts, number one, lots of hits, everything's great, and Wings are off to Nashville. Now, I personally don't know all that much about 
the how long and the whys and the who's and what came out of there other than Junior's Farm and the country uh, flavored material that uh, Paula Wings came out with. Talk about why Nashville and what was the goal and um, and then it wasn't I don't think directly into New Orleans but not long after that. Yeah I mean Nashville was explicitly we're coming here to soak up the country you know the country music scene um, but the the interesting thing with Nashville was that they arrived there with no work permits so technically everything they recorded there they did so illegally uh, so um, so yeah the, the intention we don't think was to record when they arrived there but you know Paul being Paul you know he was he was um, his his fixer over there owned a, a music publishing company had a studio I mean, he probably did have every intention of doing something over there. But really, they went over there to um, uh, to work out as a band, really. They'd, they'd just come together again as a five-piece. And uh, what was supposed to be a bonding experience in Nashville uh, turned into just all-out war, really, from what we can gather. Uh, and we've, we've got some really amazing... Uh, material for Nashville for the next book that I think is just gonna blow people's minds so I don't really want to give too much away but we've got pretty much a day-for-day blow-for-blow account of Nashville everything that happened everything that went down every scuffle every arrest everything they recorded every rehearsal they did you name it it's all in the book but also you can imagine you know apart from going down to Printer's Alley and being influenced enough to like the next day write something like Sally G and then bring it into the studio and do it. You know, Paul is having dinner with Chet Atkins, hanging around backstage with Chet Atkins and, you know, other other uh, Nashville luminaries and really sort of getting into that scene. And, uh, you know, and, and that had a lot of ramifications because part of his dinner with Chet Atkins was, uh, you know, led to walking in the park with Eloise, you know, Paul's father's tune. Um, and you can imagine, you know, if you, you, we all know about the Beatles' early influences. I mean, Chet Atkins was in there, more for George probably than Paul. Mm-hmm. But George was a, a big Chet Atkins guy, so it must have been kind of a, a thrill for Paul to be working with him because, uh, you know, on one hand, yeah, you're Paul McCartney, it doesn't get much bigger, but... That doesn't matter when you have grown up also revering somebody, you know, you, you still think of them as the, the, the sort of star that they were to you as a kid. Mm. And not to mention, you know, Chet Atkins is an incredibly, was an incredibly accomplished guitarist and, uh, you know, so to be working with him and, uh, you know, Chet Atkins also... Uh, I don't know if we should give this away on there or whether it's that well known, but uh, he he ended up handing Paul a book on his way out of the house that ended up um, inspiring a track on Venus and Mars. So, um, you know, it's it, it just beyond the actual working with Chet Atkins. This is the thing about Paul, and one of the things about him going to all of these unusual places to work. Paul is sort of a huge human sponge in a way you know anything that gets sucked into there whether it's something he read something he saw a movie a book a comic book uh you know Mm. anything is likely to be reprocessed and come out as a song one way or another you know, it really is incredible to sort of see the connections. Uh, and this is one of the things that, that we've tried to show in both volumes so far, uh, you know, how, how Paul can take some, you know, mundane thing and somehow turn it into, a, you know, a song that we all know and love. And the, the same applies to locations, you know, we're talking about locations they've recorded, but locations where Paul writes his music are just as inspirational, you know, you just got to look at the really obvious examples would be uh, Mull of Kintyre, inspired by his home in Scotland, but really a lot of Ram was inspired by the same location, it's got that kind of bucolic feel, um, and that was all inspired by, by Scotland. Uh, so, you know, location plays as big a part in Paul's songwriting as it does in his recording. Um, but then you get really odd examples in that list where you've got things like London Town, which he started writing in Australia 
of all places. But mm. when you when you look at the lyrics, it's almost like Paul was pining for home when he wrote that song. He was sitting in, uh, you know, halfway a- across the world in Australia, thinking about rainy London town in, when he was in the warmth of Australia. Going back to Nashville, walking in the park with Eloise, which I think is a marvelous recording and a great tribute to his to his dad. Also had Floyd Kramer on there, a very famous piano player, and other Nashville musicians, correct? Didn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, Lloyd Green played on there as well. He was mm. a very famous uh, pedal steel guitarist. Uh, and there was a li- we found there was a little bit of kind of inter-Beatle competition there. Uh, Paul used um, that particular musician because the other well-known steel player in Nashville had worked on albums with George and Ringo. So uh, Paul no. didn't want to be seen as a copycat. So you, you can see that friendly competition between the Beatles, you know, was, was still existed in, even in that kind of micro way of which musicians they used on their records. Can you come up with any other examples, like you mentioned Sally G. Paul wrote in Nashville, entirely new songs that he wrote in these other locations? Yeah, I mean, well, the other obvious example would be um, when they were in New Orleans and he wrote My Carnival. Uh, as his ode to New Orleans. Uh, I'm sure if I look down a song list, I'd be able to tell you uh, lots of others. Um, I well, suppose well, Linda wrote New Orleans in New Orleans. Yeah, Li- yeah Linda, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, we, we were looking down the list, actually, and I think the only exception of a place where um, the recording location didn't have a particularly heavy bearing on uh, the recording or... or in the way it did in other locations was when they were recording um, in the uh, Virgin Islands. Uh, But in other ways, it did influence the way they recorded. So, you know, when they were recording in the Virgin Islands, they had to construct vocal booths on the top deck. So if you listen to something like I'm Carrying, the vocal was recorded in the open air with the sea and the seagulls in the background. So that's almost like capturing a location on record uh, in in a very fundamentally different way. Uh, and we've seen um, tape uh, logs of things like sound effects that were recorded uh, in the Virgin Islands that they were thinking about using uh, on the album, and they decided to abandon. You know, even crazy things like the sound of a boat passing by, and um, you know, boat engines, and you know, sea effects, and all kinds of wild stuff. When you think about songs like Morse Moose and the Grey Goose. Mm. You've got to be thinking that oh, yeah. Paul is thinking about recording that. Oh, yeah, no. On in the fact, water. no, you've, you've just picked the only example I, oh. I, I, I forgot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that, that was, uh, well, I, but that was uh, a song that was born out of a, 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 jam, a sort of well, a drunken jam by the sound of it, because by all accounts, Paul was playing something that sounded like Morse code, but not actually trying to make something that sounded like Morse code. Hmm. So I suppose that's what distinguishes it from been directly influenced. He wasn't trying to make a sound like Morse code, it just happened. Yeah. And then Denny Lane decided he was going to go back and forth and bang his head against the piano or something. I think that was the story. Um, but that, yeah, that did evolve into a sea shanty, so I see what you mean. Yeah, that was, that was kind of, in the end, became uh, the, the sea shanty of London town. But, but the sea shanty is not really influenced by um, the Virgin Islands. It's not got that you know, it's not got any flavor of the Virgin Islands. It's more a, a flavor of the sea, I suppose. At the time that they were recording London Town, um, I was a member of the Wings Fun Club uh, in, in um, so that would have been 77, and I remember the issue of the, of the magazine coming out saying water wings, uh, as wings were now on these yachts in the Virgin Islands, and that almost was the title for the album, Water Wings. Um, the logistics of, of setting up recording studios on boats. Uh, I mean, uh, Jeff Emmerich sort of was the guy that was there in charge of making the technical stuff happen. I mean, there had to be a logistic ni- logistical nightmare of setting up functioning recording studios on boats with the sea air, salt water, etc. Uh, I mean, what, what can you el- elaborate on um, if anything, on getting that set, those sessions together. Um, what was the the company that they used? The record plant. The record plant, yeah. right. I, I keep thinking of Shoko, but that's for the tour. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Emmerich um, got in touch with Record Plan, which had uh, had some experience in mobile recording in all kinds of locations, and so he basically said, "Look, we're thinking of um, of doing a record on a boat. Can you?" arrange that and and they just said yeah sure if that's what you want to do we can help you and they sent a whole team so Emmerich had you know not only um, you know his crew but the record plant crew to install and oversee the use of, of the equipment up there but it, it was a, a bit of a problem because um, you know the guy whose boat it was wasn't that happy with, um, first of all, the weight of the equipment, um, the fact that, you know, when they're building vocal booths and things, this means they're just sort of, you know, hammering in, into his boat. They're building onto his boat. Right. Um, and, you know, he sort of had a fit. And, yeah. uh, you know, Two with three, right? Three, th the Wanderlust, Fair Carol. There's four. And the Samala, the Samala Fair Carol, Wanderlust. Uh, and I'm sure there's one more. One. Yeah, and one was like a full, well, maybe yeah. more than one was living facilities. That's right, yeah. Right, because, yeah. because uh, Wanderlust wasn't really part of the little flotilla. It was, it was a boat that brought them to where they were going, and it hung around for a while. And the owner said, yeah, you can, you know, you can come on to this boat if you want to. And so after Paul had a, a fight with uh, the owner of the Fair Carol, not about um, the studio installation, but I'll leave that to the you know for you to read when it comes out. Um, he ended up going to the Wanderlust, you know, to sort of calm down. You know, his steam coming out of his ears. He was really upset, and then wrote Wander, Wander, wrote Wanderlust right there. Wow. Um, so uh, yeah, but Wanderlust was technically like what was the third boat called? Well, we. Can look it up in the book Topo. when it comes. Yeah. <laughs> Topo. Topo. That sounds right. Yeah. 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 So. The um. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. I have, actually have it written down. El Samala. El Toro. Samala. El Toro. Samala. El Toro. Yeah, El Toro. Yeah. Yeah. Wanderlust. Yeah. Wanderlust. Yeah. Fair Carol. Yeah. I forgot yeah. I had a type. Fair Carol. So El Toro was the. Toro. Yeah. So there was uh, there was uh, some. Uh, it sounded like a rather uh, um, a book in itself. Those sessions. There are cases of sunstroke, if I if I remember correctly. There was uh, the police getting involved in music being played after hours, right? Mm -hmm. There was, yes. Yep. Um, <laughs> Again, uh, it's a lot like the Nashville chapter. Probably one of the highlights of our second book is uh, those sessions because, I mean, who who goes to record an album on a boat in the Virgin Islands? And Paul McCartney does. does. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and doesn't, and doesn't they expect trouble? <laughs> yeah, I think most of the people that were involved got injured in some way during those <laughs> sessions. <laughs> um, but the, it was bookended, the sessions in London Town, right by Abbey Road sessions, start right. and, mm. and at the end without Joe English and, and Jimmy, Jimmy McCullough. Mm. Um, and that's, that's a, uh, again, um, their departure from the band were too um, interesting. Uh, can you elaborate on why Jimmy and Joe left? And it was similar to what happened with uh, Henry McCullough and Denny Sywell in that the timing, very close to one another, within a short span of time, Paul lost a lead guitarist and drummer in 1973, and it happened again to him in 77. Yeah, it was actually a little longer than we realized. Um, and we, we had to make a last minute amend to our manuscript that we submitted last week um, based on some photographs that came in. Uh, and we're not, we're not gonna give anything away. Um, but yeah, Joe was there for a couple of months after, after Jimmy left. Um, Jimmy's departure had been coming for a while, really. Um, he was a volatile guy. And Paul, to a certain extent, probably saw him as, uh, as a son, really, and took him under his wing. Yeah. Do you see what I did there? Nice. <laughs> and that was look at that. And uh, and you know he re he really nurtured Jimmy and and forgave even when they had to postpone the 1976 tour because Jimmy broke his finger. You know he was really forgiving of Jimmy. Um, but I think it got to the point where uh, you know Jimmy just pushed it too far and really Paul said enough was enough. It, yeah. Um, and I, I also speculate, and this isn't in the book, this is just my own thoughts, that um, by that time, 
uh, he had his own Jimmy coming along because James was born. So it's almost like he didn't need a son anymore. So he, he had because he had a son of his own. Do you know what I mean? I don't know whether that's the case. It's probably just complete nonsense. You only need one Jimmy. Yeah, you only need one Jimmy in your life. But it's, it's strange, you know, that he, it's almost like he had a son, but then a son was born of his own, so he, he didn't need one. Anyway, that's probably nonsense. Um, and in, in terms of Joe English, um, you yeah, know, Joe was homesick from the moment he moved to London, really, and uh, was really not a really a very happy guy. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of really interesting stuff about Joe in the book that you won't anticipate that you're going to find out. Um, but yeah, he hung around as long as he could. Uh, even through some really nasty stuff going on in his own private life. Um, but eventually he, he decided yeah, to call it a day during the uh, London Town Sessions. I mean, I don't know how many, how many folks here know what happened to Joe English. Um, and in fact, coincidentally enough, I posted on my two Facebook pages a video of Joe uh, shot within the past, I guess, five years or so. Uh, Joe left Wings, went to, back to the United States. His wife had been in a very serious car accident. He wanted to be back with her, was homesick and had developed a nasty drug habit and wanted to just to get away from it all. And uh, Joe played in two bands briefly, Kingfish and Sea Level, and then uh, became born again, met God. Wait, did he meet, well, maybe he did meet God. Uh, and he turned around and started a career as a Christian uh, artist. Uh, and he did a bunch of albums through the 80s and but still evidently he reveals later on that he was still in bad shape when it came to drugs even while he was singing about God and uh, today he lives at a how would you say a church the Word of Faith Fellowship down in North Carolina I think they are it was a rather controversial place that if you remember the program a current affair uh, years ago there was a scandal on uh, how they mistreated, I think, young children who were, who lived there. And Joe and his wife are a part of that now. And the video I put on my Facebook page was an interview about how he essentially he essentially hit the mic. Really. That might be a sign, actually. He essentially was playing the devil's music and living the devil's lifestyle. He's renounced that, and now, you know, here I am. And uh, it's very fascinating. I he tried to get in touch with him years ago yeah, and got right. close. I heard him in the background. I recognized his voice, and they were like, this, this. They were very protective. This, this. I don't want to call it a cult, without knowing more about them, but they were a cult. It sounded like, <laughs> uh, and they were like, Joe, you know, watch our web. Go to our website tomorrow, and you know what? The next day there was a video that Joe recorded telling his story. And I was thinking if I got any time to talk to him on the phone, maybe Beetle Fan Magazine would be interested in it. But, you know. You guys didn't have any luck getting an interview with him or communicating yeah, yeah. with him. And uh, so, th so they finished up then the finishing touches on London Town at uh, Abbey Road. Right? In London, at home, in London Town. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Can I ask one thing that has nothing to do with location, with London Town? If you go back to Wings at the Speed of Sound, very unique album because every single member of Wings gets a lead vocal. And you got Jimmy contributing White Junko just like he did Medicine Jar. Joe English, tremendous job on vocals on Must Do Something About It. London Town comes and yeah, Jimmy and Joe eventually leave, but was there ever any talk of Jimmy contributing a song and continuing along the same lines and Joe as well? Um, because I had heard, I don't know how true it is, that Jimmy wanted to continue to contribute songs for Wings, but Paul didn't want him to at that point. Is there anything you can shed I some light on that? I doubt that's true. Um, Paul, you know, all through Back to the Egg, encouraged others to contribute songs if they had mm. something. Yeah, and there, um, there were even a couple of songs recorded during the London Town Sessions uh, of Denny's. That had never seen the light of day, uh, that we found the recording entries for. So, so yeah, they they were still actively contributing songs, but obviously not to the standard that maybe Paul thought w was good enough for a Wings album. Hmm. You know, in practical terms, um, apart from you know, he he had two reasons to encourage the others. One is because he was still encouraging this idea of Wings as a band, and in a band, 
you don't have just one guy doing all the stuff. You right. Know? Um, but also, you know, he was thinking in terms of maybe less with London Town because Linda was pregnant during those sessions and he knew that there wasn't going to be any touring coming up. But um, hmm. even through Back to the Egg, I mean, the part of the idea is, you know, if, if we have some songs by others... I don't have to do all of the singing for two hours on stage. You know, I right. can have a little break here and there. So, um, so I doubt there would have been a, a time when he would have not encouraged the others to contribute songs as well. But he was very exacting in his standards of what he would accept as another song. Mm. And you know, mm. and it's very, who knows if Jimmy came in with yet another song about you know drug overdosing, <laughs> and Paul might have said, you know, uh, we've had two. Let's <laughs> if you can write about something else maybe it's, it's also not something that um emi or capital encouraged really right, you know exactly. paul paul was the star they wanted the yeah. that's the reason why red rose speedway was cut down to a single lp it was because they thought well why are we hearing from all these other guys they're not paul you know paul was the star his face goes on the front cover mm. uh, and and they reverted to that you know in, in in some of these albums you see paul's face appearing on the album again where it didn't on Venus and Mars, you know, but by the time you get to um, something like London Town, his face is back on the cover again. Um, yeah, so a lot of those decisions, uh, Paul, Paul will probably say that there was no political influence, but there certainly was political influence, you know. In one of the interviews I did with Danny Lane, he said Paul was always encouraging him to write. Mm. And the proof is there on London Town, because yeah, yeah. there's five songs that he co-wrote with Paul. Yeah, that uh, that was the most productive. Some of the two of them had together was for London Town, where they where they did co-write, but they didn't do any of the periods really like that again. It was just that one burst of creativity between the two of them. When qu quite clearly they'd come off the back of the tour and they, uh, as a as a unit, were really harmonious, and that's probably the reason why they ended up working together so much around that time. Um, but Danny, by his own admission, uh, has said in many, many, many interviews uh, that he um, he didn't have the same motivation as Paul had to write music. So um, that was another reason why probably he wasn't as prolific as Paul. He also wrote one in Nashville that didn't um, get put on a, a Wings release, Send Me the Heart. Right. Um, again, country influenced and, uh, you know, not a bad track, really. But... Um, Wings didn't use it. I mean, he One of my all-time favorite Wing songs is "I Would Only Smile," yeah. which is a Danny Lane song that was for was not unreleased until Danny put it out. Right? It's on Japanese to Danny's album Japanese Tears. Yeah. Yeah. But it was on Red Rose Speedway, the box. Well, set, the box the live. Set. Um, and I think it was on the double album version, or at least one of the double album yeah, versions. It was. Yeah. 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 That was mm. when he was trying to again show that Wings is a band. And, uh, and the rest of Wings was, was really pretty upset when that was cut down to a single album because they endorsed this idea of showing mm. themselves as a band. So. Yeah. I think the Back to the Egg cut that you were talking about that Denny wrote, you, you, you're talking about We For Love? We For Love, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a good song. Oh, no, sorry, the, but, but there are others that, they, that he wrote during the London Town sessions uh, that you'll find out about in the second volume. Um, and uh, they were songs that Denny wrote independently from Paul. They recorded demos of them in the studio, uh, and they've never seen the light of day. Mm. So um, maybe one day when we get those London Town and Back to the Egg Rishis, are you listening, MPL? <laughs> Still waiting. And um, so enter Lawrence Huber and Steve Holly, 1978. Uh, and what was uh, kind of cool, uh, and, and I wonder if I noticed this at the time, but if you watch the video for uh, With a Little Luck, uh, Steve Holly appears in there. So the new drummer is in place already that early in the game. And Lawrence is in I've Had Enough? Is he? No. No? No. He's in I Had uh, Enough. Yeah, yeah. He's in, yeah, he's in, he's he's in, in that video. He's yeah. in the video. No. He's in the video, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in the video. Yeah, he's not on it. Now, this Steve Holly doesn't play on I've Had Enough. No, he didn't play on them, but yeah. they're in the video. They appear in the video. Yeah. And later in the year, when it came time to record the follow-up to London Town again, some interesting, maybe not as exotic and as difficult to get to as Africa and the Virgin Islands, but uh, Back to the Egg was kind of pieced together at different stops. Now, one of them that's interesting, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it because I... 
I'm it's, it's pronounced Lim. Castle. Lim. Yeah. When I interviewed Lawrence Juber, and I've had him on WFUV many times, I think the first time I mentioned it, I said something like Limpney, and he just was hysterical. At Alan it. did the same in his interview with spelled. Steve. Yeah, well, I said, I'm from the Bronx. What, it's Limp? I don't... If, if you look in the book, we do actually put um, in parentheses... Limp. Pronounced Limp, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that castle's actually uh, like a... Uh, is it like a... Uh, a hotel or something like that now maybe it's been developed a bit but it's it's a well-known talk to them about why there why a castle and how the, the logistics of of setting up studio in that environment well i mean the castle choice was was fundamentally so different from any other choice he'd made in terms of location in that he chose uh, lim castle because it was close to where the family were living uh, because in the summer of 1978 uh, they moved from London down to Sussex uh, to their two-bed cottage, uh, waterfall cottage. Uh, so the, the decision to record in a castle wasn't um, because isn't it going to be fun recording in a castle. It was because they needed somewhere to record um, you know, a five-piece band that was close to where, where Paul and Linda were living with their family at the time. Um, but it did produce some obviously interesting quirks that made it onto the album. You know, the owners of the castle themselves, the Marjories, you know, they read extracts from books on the album. Uh, you've got Lawrence playing guitar in a spiral staircase. Mm. So, you know, there are, uh, you know, acoustic influences there as well. Um, but yeah, th we're, like with the same as recording on a, a yacht in the Virgin Islands, they had to hire a mobile recording unit and then you know kind of get their head around how they were going to record in a space where the sound just bounces around uh, so they you know they, they would set different instruments up in different locations they'd have headphones on and then run an awful lot of cables around the place um, but it, it, it's nice to see in, in, in the videos they did for Back to the Egg you know you can see Lim Castle uh, I think it's in the video for Winter Rose mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can see the location uh, it's a stunning place um, and I think Steve spoke to that effect, didn't he? You know, he, they recorded that album between Scotland and Lim Castle. In Scotland, you've got views of you know pretty much the Irish coasts from the Kintyre Peninsula, uh, and then you go to Lim Castle, and you've got views out across the Channel towards France. So, amazing locations. So uh, you know, but, but like Alan said, so, you know, sometimes Paul just like to record in nice places you know so it felt more like a holiday than work but in that case it, yeah that decision to work in the castle was was just um so he was near his family really because all the kids were that by that time were also in in schools as well mm -hmm. in in sussex because it was like a two-hour drive from from Peasmarsh where they their, their new place to London so if it was going to be an Abbey Road that would have meant you know a two-hour drive every time unless he was going to stay at Cavendish Avenue but with his kids in school it, it, it just wasn't something he wanted to do and uh, well then Linda would have had to stay there too so what are they going to do not have their you know, they didn't want to not not have their kids with them you know, mm. so so for, for, for them, Lim Castle became, you know, a very sort of convenient location with some interesting acoustical properties that, uh, you know, colored the sound of the album in, a, in an interesting way. I think like the song, oh, sorry, sorry, like, We're Open Tonight has a real echoey mm -hmm. kind of an ambience, makes me think of the castle. Just me, anyway. There is a vibe, as much as it's a crunchy rock record with lots of guitars, a lot of Back to the Egg does have this kind of, can't put my finger on it, but this vibe that it was done, some of it was done. Maybe it's because I know that some of it was done in the castle. It just has that, I don't know, I can't put into words. Paul, Replica Studio sounded interesting. And all that was was a copy of... Fabby Road, right? Studio 2, was it? It was just a, a copy of the control room. The control room. Yeah, because they got to a stage in the production of Back to the Egg where really all they needed to do was a few overdubs and mixing. Um, but in the case of that album, it just seemed to take forever. So why not build a replica of Abbey Road's control room in the basement of MPL? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we, we cover all the design and, and the making of that studio and how it was utilized, the things that were recorded there. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
uh, only a millionaire rock star could afford to recreate Abbey Road Studio 2's control room in his basement. And even, with a, even with a photograph of the view from the control room down into Studio 2 as, as a window. And then yeah. once the sessions are done, the album comes out, what happened to Replica Studio? That's a really good question. I, I, I had this conversation with Mark Lewison, and he seemed to allude to the fact that it wasn't there anymore uh, when he worked for MPL last. Um, so I don't know how long it was kept as a, you know, an active recording location, because Paul, beyond 1979, seemed to spend his life at Air Studios. So, um, so I, I couldn't answer that question right now. Mm. Yeah, maybe in Volume Three. Well, uh, Ken, actually, I want to ask this: now that we've gone through uh, the 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 70s here, what is the timetable for? Is there a timetable for Volume Two? For Volume Two. For your next, for the next book, yeah. You mean Volume Three? Or well, no, the one you're. The one we just okay, we 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 turned it in last Friday, um, and um, actually, you <laughs> we have heard that it will be out in fall 24. Yeah. Yeah. Our editor. That's, um, that's our editor right there. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, All right. <laughs> And, you know, and that's what we're hoping. Now, as, as writers, for both of you, mm. when do you seriously begin, if you haven't already, start thinking in terms of volume three? I would imagine there's no break. To take a little break away or... or well, that's a conversation we're going to have after this ah, so uh, <laughs> podcast. Actually. I'm clearly going somewhere right <laughs> now that's a little <laughs> sensitive. We've been thinking about it. We've been talking about it. Um, I've been, I mean, I have my you know, whole file system to sort of go through and add to the archive that we put together for the first two. I also have, um, you know, a, almost every issue of Rolling Stone in my house, and um, I've scanned all the relevant articles up to 1980. Now I have to start scanning for the rest. Um, so we're... We're, we're saying that we're taking a break, but we're really kind of thinking about it and talking about it and figuring out how we're going to how we're going to approach it. I have been given the finger, not that finger, but uh, that we are out of time and I'm apologize for not being able to take any questions. And Ken, just, I just wanted to ask, when does volume two end? Is it the end of 79? Is it? The drug bust in Japan. It's, it's, it's sometime in 1980. It's sometime in 1980. Mystery. A very a dramatic moment in 1980. You, All right. So can, very uh, very quickly before I get yelled at, which I'm getting enough of that at home. I don't need it more. Uh, things we said today. Uh, we are planning on recording our first show of 2024 next week. Next week. It's coming up. So look for that. And hopefully we'll be able to stay on a pattern again of, of you know, every, every other week with a show. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for listening. Um, yes. uh, I love doing this thing, and I love working with these guys. Uh, and so, and I want to thank you all for being here and being listening and being out there. And a big round of applause, and thank you to Adrian Sinclair um, for joining us here. And hopefully coming on the show, I'm sure, when the time's right. I'll, I'll be back. Yeah. Uh, or when the un, underdubbed or underwear version of Venus and Mars comes out. Uh, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, a big loud round of applause for Susan Ryan. Oh, thank you, Darren. You're very kind. Hi.